to North Carolina, U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar. It is so great to be back with all of you. And I first wanted to uh, recognize Tom Perez. I know he's out there. Uh, your incredible governor, Roy Cooper, uh, who I just saw out there, someone I was so honored uh, that she introduced me at our rally the other day in Raleigh, Chief Justice Sherry Beasley, thank you. I, what an incredible woman. And then, of course, all of you. Um, who helped are helping us turn North Carolina blue. And I wanted to uh, start out by congratulating uh, the Vice President on South Carolina. And now we know, we know that all eyes are on North Carolina. So um, as uh, Wayne mentioned, I really was proud to keynote uh, your dinner a few years ago. And I did that for my friend Kay Hagan. And I, I miss Kay so much. Uh, whenever I think of Kay, I think of yellow and orange. Uh, she was uh, this person of such joy. I was honored to come back for her funeral a few months ago. And she had that last hard years, but Chip was at her side every step of the way. And one of the things that I always remember about Kay, and I think I said it when I was at your dinner last time, was one of her best lines ever, and she had many. Uh, she would always say, you know, there are two types of senators, those who spend all day on their hair, and then the women senators. <laughs> the other thing, the other thing that I remember about your dinner uh, was that you promised me that you were going to restore the power of Governor Cooper's veto. And you did it. You did it. And I remember you had a candidate in every single district. You had plans and you elected a whole bunch of new people. So I love working for an entire ticket. And I think you all know a little bit about me if you saw my announcement in the middle of the blizzard. Um, with four inches of snow on my head, I did it just to impress North Carolina. Uh, a lot of people predicted I wouldn't make it through that speech, and then they thought I wouldn't make it through the summer, and then I wouldn't make it to the debates, but here I am headed into Super Tuesday. And by the way, that last debate in South Carolina was one I won't forget. I, I don't know if you saw the photo. I don't always have viral moments because I actually like try to answer the questions. And I also remember that there's a bunch of people out there watching who haven't decided yet, who may be independents, who didn't even vote in 2016. But there I was, and there was a dispute going on um, between the vice president and Tom Steyer, who were then either side of me. And uh, at one point, I know Mayor Bloomberg was here earlier, the president earlier in the week had gone after him and claimed he was five foot four. I want you to know I am the only one on that stage that has the creds that I am five foot four, all right? So when I am on those debates, I stand on this little, uh, this little box, okay, so you can see me. So I am on my box, and those two start going at it. Vice President stays at his podium, but Tom Steyer is totally moving into my space, if you've ever seen, and they're gesturing, and I cannot move back because I will fall off my box. And then I think to myself, as I'm smiling, and that is the photo, I think, you know what? If Tom Steyer accidentally hits me off that box, he's got deep pockets, so I'm going to be so okay. <laughs> So in any case, our campaign has beaten the odds every step of the way. And part of that is because I believe in my soul that despite the disputes that you see on that debate stage, that what unites us is so much bigger than what divides us. 
And we know here in North Carolina that this election is an economic check on this president, a president who hasn't increased the minimum wage, a president who made a bunch of promises about bringing down the prices of pharmaceuticals that he hasn't delivered on, a president that promised a bunch of infrastructure that he hasn't delivered on. But we also know it is something more than that to a lot of people from this state that maybe stayed home in 2016, maybe voted for another candidate. And those are the people that I want to bring with me. Those are the people that look at this election and they think, I think I want to bring decency back to the White House. They watch this, they watch this president and they remember the days when you used to watch the president even if you didn't vote for that president and your kids could watch the president. And now, if this president is at a rally, and a kid comes in the room, the parents have to mute the volume because you have no idea what he's going to say. This election is also a patriotism check on this president. This is a president that stood next to Vladimir Putin at the G20, and when a reporter asked about Russian interference in our election, he looked at that ruthless dictator and he made a joke about it. Think about it. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have lost their lives on the battlefield standing up for democracy. That's what World War II was about. Thousands of people from this patriotic state. Four little girls at a church in Alabama. I'm going to be in Alabama tomorrow. Four little girls lost their lives at the height of the civil rights movement. Innocence, simply trying to be part of our democracy. And others were trying to shove them out of it. The greatest moments and the worst moments in this country's history have been about democracy, civil rights, freedoms. That's what that lunch counter was about that I got, oh, I got to visit it in Greensboro just two days ago. It is about our democracy. And this president makes a joke about it. So what I think is this, Donald Trump's worst nightmare is that our fired up Democrats will march to victory with independents and moderate Republicans. His worst nightmare is that the people in the middle who are tired of the insults and the back and forth and the mean tweets have someone to vote for. So if you feel stuck in the middle of the extremes in our politics, you've got a home with me. So let me tell you about what I think we need to get done as a party, no matter who you are supporting. First of all, we must pass a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. That is all of that outside money that has come in. And this state knows this so well with that court case that I quote everywhere where they said that the legislature had discriminated the Republicans with surgical precision against African Americans. We must restore the Federal Voting Rights Act and pass my bill to register every kid automatically in this country when they turn 18. If Target can find a pair of shoes with a SKU number in Hawaii, we should be able to register everyone in this country. What else? Getting rid of gerrymandering, something you know too well in this state, and getting rid of voting purges. Uh, my friend Stacey Abrams, who should be the governor of Georgia right now, she, she put it this way about purges. She said this. She said, you know, if you don't go to church or synagogue or mosque for a year or two, you don't lose your right to worship. And if you don't go to a meeting like this for a year or two, you don't lose your right under the Constitution to assemble. And if you haven't voted for a, year, a few years and you show up at the voting booth and you find out your name is not on that list, you should never lose your right to vote. That is voting purges. What else can we do? Well, we can end Donald Trump's shameful acts of trying to kick people off their insurance for pre-existing conditions. We can do that. We can take on Big Pharma and bring down the cost of prescription drugs. We can take on the NRA. And when we were in Charleston this last week, once again, you see that church. And you think about what happened in that church with the worshipers when a white nationalist walked in and gunned them down. You know what bill is sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk right now? The bill to close the Charleston loophole. 
to simply give law enforcement time to look at background check. What else is on there? Universal background checks. So the only way we get these gun safety bills done and so many other things that I've talked about today is by winning, not just eking out a victory at four in the morning, North Carolina, because I tell you if we do it this way, it will not be your state. We do it by winning big, by taking back the U.S. Senate and sending Mitch McConnell packing. You know what else we got to do? We got to make it easier for people to pay back their student loans and making it easier for people to afford college. And in a state in that tradition of Governor Hunt, a state that understands how important education is, I found 137 things that a new president can do in her first 100 days that are legal without Congress. And the thing that I could do in the first 100 seconds is fire Betsy DeVos. Then there are foreign policy challenges, because we have a president that repeatedly decides to side with tyrants instead of allies, who decides to side with dictators instead of innocents. So what should we do? One, we should repair our alliances around the world. Uh, two, we should renew our leadership around the world. Three, renegotiate back into international agreements like the International Climate Change Agreement and the Iranian Nuclear Agreement. And four, we should respond appropriately to threats around the world. That means not tweeting out at 4 a.m. in your bathrobe issues of international importance. And five, we should reassert American values. Those are my five R's, but they really boil down to one R, return to sanity in our foreign policy. This is our goals. We know we are not going to outdivide the divider in chief. But we know that we can bring dignity back to the White House. Because when I talk to people and I say what I like to think about is that we need to build a blue wall of Democratic votes around states like North Carolina and states in the Midwest. And when we build that blue wall, it's going to be so great in the next election in 2020. And we are going to make Donald Trump pay for it. Um, <laughs> And one of the things I find when I talk to people that maybe voted for him or stayed home is that they get sick and tired of his whining. It might not be the first thing you think about, but they are. They are tired of it. He blames everyone. He blames Barack Obama for our problems. He blames the Fed chair that he nominated. He blames the generals that he commands. And yes, he once blamed the entire kingdom of Denmark. Who does that? That's what he does. He even blamed the Prime Minister of Canada, this is one of my favorite ones, for cutting him out, Trump, out of the home version, the Canadian version of Home Alone 2. That is a true story. So instead, I want you to picture this, and I'll talk here at the end about myself, because I got a different background than Donald Trump. What did he get? He got $413 million in the course of his life from his dad. This is my family story. My grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the mines, iron ore mines in northern Minnesota. He never graduated from high school because he had to help to take care of his nine brothers and sisters. His parents died when he was very young. And then one of the youngest kids, Hannah, was brought to an orphanage in Duluth. He said he would go get her. He was the oldest boy. And when he had enough money, he borrowed a car and he brought her back. He and my grandma raised those nine kids. And then they had my dad and his brother. And my grandpa saved money in a coffee can in the basement to send my dad to a two-year community college. That was our family trust. And I can tell you that $413 million does not fit in a coffee can in the basement. <laughs> From there, my dad went to a community college and then the University of Minnesota. Uh, he became a writer and a journalist. He covered the Vikings. And if you want to know something about resilience, he once wrote a book that is sadly still relevant today called Will the Minnesota Vikings Ever Win the Super Bowl? <laughs> My mom grew up in Milwaukee. She wanted to be a teacher. She came to Minnesota. She taught second grade until she was 70 years old. 
So I stand before you today, North Carolinians, I stand before you today as a granddaughter of an iron ore miner, as a daughter of a teacher and a newspaper man, as the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate for the state of Minnesota, and a candidate for president of the United States. That, that is because we live in a country of shared dreams. Though no matter where you come from or who you know or what you look like or the color of your skin or how much money you have or where you worship or who you love, that you can make it in the United States of America. So I have come back so many times and defied expectations. And I had a lot of time to think about what we want in a president during those impeachment hearings. Because all of that was about a president that was putting his private interests, his partisan interests, in front of the interests of our country. And we were up there so late at night, I would get bleary-eyed, and we were talking about the Founding Fathers so much that I would look at my colleagues and start to think that their hair looked like a Founding Father. <laughs> But as I sat there and thought about this president, I realized one key thing, and that is, despite everything else, his lack of respect for the law, the way he violates the law, the way he doesn't care about his democracy and bulldozes through our democracy every day. I thought of how he lacked empathy, because great leaders can put themselves in the shoes of the people that they represent. There is an old story about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he was so loved because he got us through one of the worst times in our country. And when he died, they put his body on a train that went from Georgia to Washington, D.C. And people spontaneously stood by the train tracks to show their respect. And a reporter came upon a guy, a regular guy who had his hat across his chest, and he was sobbing. And the reporter said, sir, uh, do you mind me asking, did you know the president? And the guy says, no, I didn't know the president, but the president knew me. He knew me. That is the sacred trust between the president of the United States and the people of this country. So I can tell you this, if you are trying to figure out how to stretch your paycheck or the paycheck of someone in your family to pay for their rent and their mortgage, I will fight for you, and I know you. If you are trying to decide between helping your parents with long-term care, like I struggle with with my dad, or child care or college for your kids, I know you, and I will fight for you. And if someone in your family is trying to figure out how they're going to fill their prescription for insulin or fill their refrigerator with food, I know you, and I will fight for you. That is empathy. That is being able to put yourself in the shoes of the people that you represent. So I ask for your support. I have been on a long, long journey, and I love this state, and I love the memory of Kay Hagan. But I can tell you this, no matter what happens, when we head into that convention in Milwaukee, we have a mission. In the words of my friend John McCain, the last thing he showed me, the last time I saw him before he died when he was in his ranch, he showed me the words that said, there is nothing more liberating than fighting for a cause larger than yourself. That is what this election is for America. So remember, despite all these fights we're going to have, what unites us is bigger than what divides us. I ask for your support. Thank you for all you've done. Let's win back North Carolina in the presidential race. Thank you. Our nation was attacked on September 11th of 2001. And I responded to that in part by taking an oath.